Welcome to the NIHR Dementia Researcher podcast brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world. Hello everybody, I'm Dr Anna Volkmer and today I'm hosting this special podcast recording Roundup after the 2022 International Society for Frontotemporal Dementias Conference in Lille otherwise known as the ISFTD conference. We will be discussing some of our own presentations and what we've all seen and heard that has also interested us. Now, many of you will know me. I'm a speech and language therapist and NIHR advanced fellow based at UCL, as well as a frequent podcast host and blogger at NIHR Dementia. I'm sure you're getting fed up with me by now. But what you may not know is that I'm privileged to be a guest member of the UCL Dementia Research Centre Brain Behaviour Group, or the BBG, which is Professor Jason Warren's lab group. And today I've been joined by three other members of that group, Dr Chris Hardy, Jess Jang, and first-timer to NIHR Dementia, Dr Jochen van Tuft. Or Tuft. Um, hello, everybody. Hello. Hi. Hi. So can we start with a quick round of introductions and perhaps if you can all explain who you are and a little bit about your work, that would be great. So shall we start with Jochen? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, so my name is Jochen van het Hoofd. I am um, a PhD candidate um, doing my PhD at the Alzheimer's Center Amsterdam. And my research is focused on uh, music and um, music musicality in dementia. And um, uh, I'm now currently at the DRC for a six months um, um, international fellowship with Professor Jason Warren. Um, very, uh, very happy to be here. Thank you. Exciting. Thank you, Jochen. Chris, do you want to introduce yourself? Though I think you'll be known to many of our listeners. Oh, I'm not sure about that, but uh, morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Chris Hardy. Uh, I'm a senior research fellow at, in Jason's group. Um, I've been at the Dementia Research Centre for, I think, a decade now, which is terrifyingly long. Um, but my, my research, uh, I'm a psychologist by background. My research uh, involves um, understanding more about the symptomatology of the primary progressive aphasias, which are a rare group of language-led dementias, and also in developing sort of uh, tests of uh, complex uh, hearing, uh, tests of auditory cognition uh, for PPA and, and for Alzheimer's disease as, as, as well. And yeah, pleasure to be here. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. And Jess? Um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jess. I'm a current PhD student in uh, Jason's lab. I'm supervised by both Jason and Chris, actually. Um, so my research revolves um, a lot around uh, the complex auditory perception that Chris just spoke about. Um, so my PhD is focused on exactly that, complex auditory perception, both like in speech and maybe edging a bit into music, into Jochen's territory. But then, um, uh, yeah, so that's actually my current PhD work. And I study that in AD, uh, Alzheimer's disease and frontotemporal dementia as well. Great. Thank you, Jess. Now, um, before I ask you about your own talks and posters and other people's, perhaps I could get your thoughts on the host city, which was Lille. Chris, I know you particularly enjoyed our ridiculously early morning run around the Citadel. No, I didn't. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I did. (laughs) No, it was pitch black. We we had to get up because the conference starts early. We had to get up at I think I wake up at five Lille time, which is four UK time. Or so. I don't know what's going on, but we had a, a miserable run in the pitch black. I didn't see a single sight because you couldn't see sort of a foot in front of us. Ah, uh, no. And you were, I've never met a more of a morning person than you, Anna. I, I couldn't believe the stream of chat you managed to keep up for our hour run. I, you said I'll later, give in the day, later in the day, you said to me something like, oh, I knew you were a chatty person in the day. I didn't know you were a chatty person all day. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So what did the rest of you think about the, the, the town, Leo? Oh, yeah. I loved it. It was so nice. Yeah. Um, yeah, wasn't expecting it. It was like an hour and a half to get to and be able to use so it's super quick. And it was, you know, just walking around town, really wanted to shop and things like that. Um, and uh, 
Yeah, it was, it, it was really, really nice. Unexpected. I've never heard much about Loom before and going there was, I, I had a misconception. I thought your Disney was close by, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, it was all I, all I knew about Loom. I thought your Disney was close by. No, not at all. I'm not even sure where your age me is, but yeah, mm-hmm. no, good point. But now, Jess, while you're here, while you're chatting with us, um, you were one of the stars of the conference with your awesome platform presentation. I wouldn't um, say that. <laughs> oh, yeah, come on. I want you to tell us about it. Blow by blow account, including your kind of practice, walk up the steps the day before. How did the presentation go and how can people find about, out about your work online? Um, th- well, thank you, Anna. Um, yeah, I, I was so grateful for ISFTD for wanting to do, uh, or not wanting, but like being willing to take me on as um, one of the 10 minute presentations um, to give doing the neuropsychology session. Um, and it, I wasn't expecting, it was fantastic to speak in such an auditorium as well and kind of explain about the work because um, I mean, we all work within hearing and complex hearing, but it's not really usually a topic that's spoken about. So it's really nice to have that chance to talk about it. Um, So my talk was on uh, my PhD work, which is degraded speech perception in Alzheimer's disease and primary progressive aphasias. Um, And I used an artificial manipulation called noise recoding, which kind of removes like certain details and like spectral details and intelligibility from the speech while preserving temporal cues. So it's kind of intelligible at certain amounts. Um, the joke is it kind of sounds like Batman, the lower you go, I don't know. Um, but it's, um, it's a really interesting and really good um, manipulation to kind of relate towards real world hearing functions. Um, like a busy telephone line or a video conferencing call, kind of like what we're doing on this podcast at the moment. Um, and using that manipulation, I was able to parse out um, the different diagnostic groups. So um, the group that performed the worst was the leukopenic variants, uh, followed by the non fluent variants, as well as the Alzheimer's disease, and surprisingly the semantic variants as well, um, which kind of showcases a, a deficit there in speech perception, also in semantic variant groups, even though past degraded speech paradigms haven't really necessarily shown that, but I think that speaks to um, the noise encoding manipulations that we use there. So um, yeah, it it was um, overall, it was really nice to present about the work and uh, people can definitely look out for the work in the future because hopefully we'll get a paper published about it soon. Um, So that'd be really, really nice. Watch this space, in other words, watch this space. Yeah. But I, I also think I, I'm, I'm all definitely be watching the space and I've talked about it with you before because I think the, the clinical implications are so useful, aren't they? Because people often say to us, oh, I think my partner can't hear me or they say I can't hear things in noisy environments or, but, or I find certain accents more difficult. And we found that hard to kind of rationalise for people in the past or even think about what that means but actually the work you're doing will help us kind of you know feed back to people yeah that's you know part of the part of the disease process and think of strategies to help people manage that in in real life yeah that'd be that'd be so good so if you have this research out that basically says that yes it is hard not even just for the ppas the actual language bit but actually that it's an auditory processing difficulty that they also have it kind of builds into the general difficulties that they could have. So environmental strategy, clinical strategies to try to help manage that um, it would be would be great. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Now, Chris, Jochem and I, we all had posters presentations. We, um, we weren't as, we didn't get to go up on the big, huge stage like Jess, but we did have poster presentations. So Jochem, do you want to tell us a bit about your poster? Because it kind of, I guess in my mind, as a, simple speech therapist it kind of aligns quite well with what Jess does is that fair is probably under researched is uh, in dementia is is um, auditory cognition in general and um, music as an extension of that as a um, complex auditory um, stimulant stimulant um, is 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 of course part of this so I guess um, 
so this aligns with with um, this lab, I would say. So what what I um, looked into and what was uh, what I presented on my poster was looking into musicality, and uh, musicality is a broad term of um, 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 all the skills involved in understanding music, but also musical behavior. And uh, I looked specifically uh, for this in uh, BVFTD uh, compared to Alzheimer's disease and uh, healthy controls. And um, the idea for this is um, um, that uh, we have ideas that musicality and why we listen to music is related to other cognitive functions, especially social functions. And, um, and FTD is the disorder where well, social cognition or social functions are typically impaired. However, we don't have a gold standard for measuring this. And uh, because of the relationship between musicality and social cognition, music might help us in, um, in investigating these uh, impairments. So what we did, did in this study, we investigated uh, musicality with uh, various tests such as um, music emotion recognition, uh, melody recognition, but also rhythm and, um, and tempo recognition. And, uh, and we investigated certain aspects of social cognition, such as uh, visual emotion recognition, uh, understanding of social norms, or under understanding of indirect speech. And then we investigated if they were indeed related to each other. And um, what we found was that um, that indeed uh, patients with FTD scored lower on the musicality tasks compared to uh, Alzheimer patients and controls, and that they were related to social cognition functions, which is very exciting. That it um, from our it well it it fitted our hypothesis uh, that, that we had, and. Um, yeah, it gives us an insight into how music might potentially help in um, in investigating more social cognitive functions. Absolutely, it's it reminds me of a test uh, called the the awareness of social inferencing test. Have you ever heard of that, Jochem? Where you it's these it's a video recordings of people, and it's an Australian test, and they're these video recordings of people and they're being surprised or anxious or happy and they never say they are but they obviously use the tone of their voice and their kind of non-verbal communication and my I had done that with a couple of I have done that test with a couple of people with frontotemporal dementia with particularly with people with semantic variant PPA and they always fail it and um and it just makes so much sense that that is because that's all about tone and pitch and inflection isn't it yeah, I think that that's a very interesting uh, observation indeed, because um, well, th this requires what we call a theory of mind, that you understand that someone else has a different mind from your from your own, and that you can infer that mind based on cues that you would get from speech or from uh, uh, from uh, um, from facial expressions, and um, and if you think about it. Um, the the melody and the rhythm of someone's someone's speech or uh, is very important into inferring these um, these cues. So musical features or skills are definitely important for this um, understanding of social cues. Yeah, so interesting. And again, lots of um, I think lots of value. Most yeah, I'm I'm just thinking of a, a client I a family I spoke with recently who couldn't understand why their relative was less empathic. And I spent a lot of time talking about tone and pitch as well as um like that theory of mind stuff with them. And I think that's really helpful for people. But yeah, and therapies as well will be exciting. Um but let's move on. Let's talk about Chris's poster. Chris, can you tell us a bit about yours, please? Yeah, sure. So I was presenting some work uh, that we've been doing with uh, carers of people with uh, PPA. And this is uh, uh, work that we've been trying to do for a number of years now. So it's exciting to see it sort of coming to fruition. Um, and I should say this is in collaboration with uh, Kathy Taylor-Rubin in Australia as well. I think has been on this podcast um, b before as a guest. 
Um, but yeah, we've been trying to uh, sort of learn from caregivers of people with PPA about the, the the course of symptoms that people with the different variants of PPA, the progressive aphasias, uh, experience over the course of their, of their disease. And we've tried to define uh, six symptom-led stages for each uh, subtype, each main subtype of, of PPA in the hope that this will be helpful for not only for clinicians and researchers, but also for people living with the disease themselves and also their, their family members and partners and, and carers as they come to um, sort of prepare for what comes next and can predict which major care milestones might be emerging next. So it was um, yeah, exciting to, to share our progress on that work uh, to date. And um, yeah, I'm not as optimistic about the timescale for getting a paper out as <laughs> as I know Jess is with, with hers, with good reason, but uh, hopefully that won't be too much longer before that sees the light of day. Great. Thank you, Chris. And I should say um, that kind of aligns really well with some of the work I've been doing. So I had a poster with Chris um, where we ran some focus groups with people with PPA and their family members, or we we actually had a student run them. And they asked them, uh, asked them, the people with PPA and their family members, what they would like from speech therapy. And um, we collected some really amazing data that we uh, we analysed using thematic analysis and and basically drew out lots of themes, including the fact that lots of these people don't know what speech therapists do. So it's really hard for them to even understand what they should be asking for and when, which really interlinks really nicely with what Chris is saying about, you know, the more we understand about the disease journey, the staging, the more we can kind of work out what a care pathway might look like so that people can ask for the right things at the right times. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like we've been speaking about our own research for a little while. I wonder whether we should talk about what other people were doing at the conference. Um, so I wondered what each of your highlights were. I feel like I can anticipate what Jess's highlight was because um, we we met. It was one of the it was a lady that presented just before you. I'm anticipating that it might have been one of your highlights, and then we met her in the break. It was it, yeah. Yeah, so, so what we're speaking about is the presentation done by Dr. Boon Lee T, um, who had, um, a, she presented at the last ISFTD, which was virtual, and it was, um, I forgot how the premise of it was, it was one of those separate video sessions that you can tune into, um, and it was fascinating because it was on the uh, people um, who speak Chinese or Cantonese or basically a, a Mandarin uh, <clears throat> and how PPA manifest in their language uh, which I always thought was really interesting as someone who's a native Mandarin speaker I always thought you know the criteria for PPA is very catered towards an English speaking population or generally maybe more European I can't speak maybe Yochum, you can correct me on how Dutch plays into this um, but I was just thinking that it, it was it was so so interesting two years ago to hear about her work on trying to develop um, a battery as well as uh, appropriate criteria for those who speak um, a tonal language such as uh, Chinese, uh, both in Mandarin Cant and Cantonese form. Um, so it was great that this time she extended even further and shared her new results and also on tone perception, not just how they were speaking, but also their tone perception as well, which also kind of links into when we were talking about pitch um, and um, the importance of that when it comes to communication on all facets. Yeah, so that was really, um, that was really cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was a really good talk, wasn't it? She, it? she had some really amazing audio clips as well to really illustrate the tonal difference and show how people couldn't understand those di those differences in tone but also couldn't use them and unsurprisingly I felt I was less surprised when she explained that people with non-fluent variant PPA can't use tone I, I didn't that you know that makes complete sense because of their speech their motor speech disorder but I guess I was perhaps more surprised about that comprehension side that they couldn't perceive you know they weren't following understanding the tonal differences yeah, and we we were we spoke after um, her her talk because we were back to back from each other, and she was saying like, because she showed that semantic variants struggled with, especially with tone perception, and she was like, 
I was really interesting that you also showed that they have difficulty listening to degraded speech perception. It's interesting that semantic variance showing this profile and on this aspect. And um, uh, I, I was thinking it is particularly interesting because they do seem to fall a bit on prosty, like emotional prosty as well. So um, that would that is some place to explore, maybe. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And we were kind of saying that maybe we should be assessing tone and tonal perception a much earlier stage. Um, what about the rest of you? Did anybody else want to share any of their highlights? Jochen, what was your major highlight? That I wanted to highlight um, in uh, from presentations that were in um, in Paris as well, and um, uh, one was by uh, Masoud Hussein, where he talked about um, uh, apathy and uh, motivation, which was absolutely, uh, which was very interesting, uh, where he where he took the approach of um, how can brain disorders teach us. Um, about how our brain works. So uh, he talked about very strategic brain infarcts, for example, and how the people would present with, well, they, that they couldn't be bothered and were very apathetic. And um, and what I liked is that it teaches so much as well as how, how, how uh, our brain works. Um, and the same goes for two other speakers that were um, in Paris, which were uh, Emmanuel Foll and um, Leonardo de, uh, de Souza, and they talked about uh, creativity, where they investigated uh, creativity in uh, in BVFTD, and um, and the same goes for this. What I love is because, of course, you and I also have we have motivation, we have creativity, so uh, these disorders can teach us so much about how we behave and how our brain functions. And um, and uh, so this was very, yeah, I thought very interesting, yeah. Brilliant. I'm sad we missed that. We didn't make it to Paris, didn't we? We should, we should explain to the listeners that they, they had a pre-event in Paris, didn't they, the day before, a kind of seminar event, and then the three main days of the conference were in Lille. Um, so it was a little bit tricky to kind of navigate that geographically to make it to both, but it was, so we were a bit sad to, to miss that, that day. But thank you for sharing that, Jochen. That's really helpful. Um, Chris, did you want to flag anything that you thought was really interesting? Um, I, I agree with Jochen and Jess, the really interesting um, uh, things that they've spoken about. Um, for me, I think that one of the themes at the conference was really about um, the late, the diagnostic labels and categories and criteria that, that we're using and lots of talk about uh, different uh, perhaps developments in, in in that space. So um, we had presentations about you know right temporal variant frontal temporal dementia about semantic behavioural frontal frontal temporal dementia, and then within the uh, within progressive non fluent aphasia or the non fluent agomatic variant of PPA, I think there were there was a, a talk by uh, Ignacia Ilangal and a poster by. Uh, Diego Lorca Pools from the same group at UCSF from Mary Lou Gornetampini's uh, group. And they're talking about you've got this constellation of uh, uh, so non fluent agomatic variant PPA is uh, is recognised as a, a subtype in which people either have sort of F full speech, maybe a praxia of speech, but also can have a grammatism uh, difficulties using grammar. And there's lots of talk about whether or not to sort of uh, to, to lump these potentially different clinical profiles together under one umbrella term or to split them out as, as unique entities. And their conclusion was that actually um, we should we should be lumping them together, but perhaps the, the terminology that we're using at the moment isn't isn't correct. And because a practice of speech is, is, is not uh, an aphasia in its purest form. So they were suggesting that perhaps we should use the term, uh, I think, progressive non-fluent speech language disorders. Which I, which I I found interesting, and also found interesting their their brain imaging uh, work, which suggested um, at least four different anatomical profiles uh, for, for for this across this spectrum, uh, including uh, quite a posterior uh, profile in uh, in sort of left uh, around left temporoparietal junction, which mirrors what we certainly see in some of our our patients. Um, that that kind of take part in our research, and perhaps 
you, you might expect that that is that group who have that more posterior atrophy, who, who have those cardinal problems with uh, some of the basic auditory perception that, that Jess was talking about. Um, so yeah, that, that was something I, f I found really interesting, but there was, it was really a conference. I really enjoyed it. And um, there's there so much uh, going on that we won't be able to do justice here. No, I'm really glad you shared that poster. I'm sad I missed it because actually that's, you and I have spoken about terminology quite a lot before because it really foxes some of the clinicians out in the field. I get phone calls from speech and language therapists looking for advice and saying, well, they're apraxic. They're not aphasic. So surely they're not a progressive aphasic. So it's it can be, I think what you're just, I think that idea of encompassing both, including speech and language in that, that makes cognitively makes sense to me at least um yeah interesting and i'm sure would make sense to lots of our clients um because i think they i think terminology just confuses them so much <laughs> um did anybody see the opening talk by marcel meslem we should we should mention him um he, he so he for those who don't know he's um Professor Marcel Meslin, he's from Northwestern University in Chicago, and he had he did the opening kind of keynote speech really, and um, he had a great title to his speech. It was called "Menage et Toi, Temporal Pole, Word Comprehension, and TDPC." But I missed it. Did any of you see it? Yes, it w was very interesting, and of course, uh, f very nice to see him talk. He is an absolute legend uh, uh, within the field. And um, and he chose a very very interesting title as well, and and he talked about the um, well the the history of of semantic dementia, which of course on its own is a is a very interesting uh, a disorder, um, which can present with such focal uh, brain damage of the temporal pole, and um, and with typical uh, protein misfolding. Um, and um, yeah, and about the history and how it was recognized, uh, because in the beginning, of course, dementia was was more seen as maybe a, a memory impairment disorder. But as more knowledge uh, was obtained, um, it w was found that in this disorder, something very specific, other very specific, was impaired: the, the semantic knowledge, and um, and which presents with word comprehension. Uh, deficits but also other uh, symptoms so he 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 talked about that and was um was very very interesting indeed yeah it sounds i'm sad i missed it i'm he's he is a good speaker isn't he um but i, I guess I, I should um i can't help but talk about dr maya henry somebody i facilitated some networking here for jess and chris with dr maya henry so she's a um speech and language therapy researcher from the university of austin texas and she um, did. A, she was one of the only speech and language therapy, the therapeutic researchers who did a um, talk on the big stage. And hers was about immediate and long term benefits of restitutive treatment for speech and language in PPA. I'm a little bit biased, of course, because as a speech and language therapist, um, but I found this talk really engaging. Um, I spoke. She talked about the fact that the essentially that. Um, certain types of interventions like script training and uh, what lexical retrieval therapies um, are demonstrating positive changes for people living with different PPAs. And she also flagged that um, we need to be looking more functionally, looking at things like communication partner training. So um, obviously this is an area, I say obviously, because you all know this, but I'm particularly interested in this, in this kind of work. Did, what did you think of her talk? I, I thought it was uh, amazing. I've seen her talk before in Sydney, um, I think four years ago. Um, but yeah, no, I love love her work. I think she's an uh, amazing, amazing clinician, amazing scientist. And um, I think, yeah, I think her work is so important in proving that um, for, for the patients that we see with progressive language disorders, that it's not, you know, that's, that's not it. There, there, there is evidence based help that that, that can work for, for people and, and the evidence that that she um and uh, uh emily rogowski who also spoke in, in her session that uh, you know uh, uh, and others um at our center and around the world are producing i think is, is just so encouraging but yeah no, i really enjoyed um uh my henry's talk yeah it's funny there was a belgian neurologist who afterwards said to me i haven't really thought that speech therapy could help but after seeing 
Maya talk, I'm going to start trying to find those speech therapists. So uh, as you say, Chris, it's really important, I think, isn't it, that those talks are on the big stage. Um, did anyone go to the Carers Conference? There were some quite, I think, Jess, you did. There were some quite moving first-hand accounts there, weren't there? Yeah, I went, but unfortunately, I think I went only to the first one to obviously catch Anna, your talk, as well as Caroline Greaves gave a talk from um, the Dementia Research Centre as well. Um, and it was it was great. Uh, Yolanda also gave a talk, and I'm, I'm forgetting at the moment um, the other person, but um, the, the first session is what I went to. And it was really, really cool, actually, to see a care session that way. And they had, like, three or four languages on the go as well. You had to get a headset to get all, like, on-site translations, which I thought was really good and made it really quite accessible if your first language wasn't um, English, for example, for the carers meeting. I got asked a question in French and I didn't have the headset on. Were you there when that happened? And I didn't know what they were saying. And it, the question went on and on and on. And I was I was nodding along like an aphasic person, so thinking and reacting to the tone. And, <laughs> and then they translated it, but it took a while. But no, the, it was an amazing setup. That, that was the kind of, it was like a parallel session to the main conference, wasn't it? Um, and you missed then, there was a really great talk actually at the end by someone called Fiona Comfort. I think that's how you say her name. She's a, um, do you know her? She's uh, got a psychology background, neuropsychology, and she's a researcher in Sydney. And she presented on criminality and risk behaviours in frontotemporal dementia. And they were looking at the different types of frontotemporal dementias. And they had a kind of, um, they'd asked carers to check off behaviours that their relatives had, um, they'd seen in their relatives. So like whether they had had uh, parking tickets or um, whether they shouted or were verbally aggressive or were physically aggressive or um, anything more. And what they found was that actually carers, um, the number of carers who reported um, aggression was significantly high in the in anonymously in this survey they did was significantly higher than what they knew of uh, in in the clinical setting so basically and they asked people and people said they just didn't tell anybody um so there were lots and lots of carers being essentially um have uh, receiving domestic abuse from their relatives with the diagnosis but hadn't actually informed anyone so they were saying we need to be more careful about um, how we manage that in, in clinic and more mindful and we should actually make space for questions to, to make sure that we're asking people and their family members if well the family members really if, if they're they're experiencing that behavior and it was more prevalent it was they were talking about behavioral variant FTD primarily but they also saw I think if I remember correctly there was some of that also within the semantic group as well but obviously it was primarily the behavioral variant but I thought it was just really it was quite um it was quite moving because it really, I, I was quite shocked at how many people said they'd never told anybody that about that aggression that they'd received. Um, so that's a good lesson, really. Um, now, is there anything else we haven't mentioned that anyone has a burning desire to mention? I was just going to say, just from the perspective of, uh, sort of the, the early career research side, so um, yeah. I, I'm one of Jess's supervisors, privileged to be one of Jess's supervisors, and I've never been so vicariously nervous um, for, for somebody as, as watching Jess uh, go up on that stage, because it was a huge auditorium. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen one that, that big, um, and I had absolutely no reason to be nervous, because Jess is an incredible speaker, and I knew she would do. Uh, other than me telling you right before that, I was so Apart nervous. Apart from that. <laughs> 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 but I, was, I, I don't think I've ever been as, as proud as, as somebody as, as, as seeing that. And so that was just uh, really interesting you know, as, as somebody who's, uh, you know, working their way, stumbling their way through uh, the postdoctoral uh, levels and, and to be fortunate enough to now supervise somebody. And it was, it was a really amazing experience to, to, to watch somebody um, who I work with uh, smashing it, uh, like Jess did. So just wanted to mention that. Here, here, you did two, smash it. Two times. <laughs> yeah. Now, I think this might be all we have time for today, I'm afraid. So um, just just to check in with everybody, is it okay if listeners contact you if you have if they've got any questions or want to talk about your work? Everybody's nodding. Um, we will put links to everybody's um, Twitter feeds on the website. 
Um, but I have one more question. You can kind of vote with your just a yay or nay. Will you all be going to the next ISFTT conference in 2024 in Amsterdam? And what do you think? Well, will you all be going? Yes or no? Yeah, yes. Jochen's going to host us, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was Rome game. yeah, I, I host all of you. So uh, definitely. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Brilliant. And um, um, do you think there'll be any new themes or do you think we'll be? I've, I'm wondering whether the whole thing about um, terminology will continue as a, as a big theme. Yeah. It's probably about time to end today's podcast recording. I'd like to thank our panelists, Chris, Jess, and Jochen. You can find information about all of us on the Dementia Researcher website. And in the meantime, please remember to like and subscribe and leave a review on this podcast through SoundCloud or iTunes. Thank you all very much. And until next time, bye now. Bye. Bye, cheers. Brought to you by DementiaResearcher.nihr.ac.uk in association with Alzheimer's Research UK and Alzheimer's Society, supporting early career dementia researchers across the world.